Good evening, I am Anton Shoyon. It is a great pleasure for me to be here as part of this lecture series and I am particularly grateful to Professor Nahera for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. This is a nostalgic event for me because I am able to return to some of the part of my life that, that was the most uh, uh, rewarding and most exciting uh, through, through the infant studies particularly. So, thank you very much. And I will start this lecture on the clinical assessment and theoretical considerations of the affective development and functioning of infants talking about 3 to 36 months of age. What I'm going to cover briefly would be affects and affect development are grounded in biology. Affect expression by facial, verbal, or vocal and motor behaviors is measurable. Affect balance is a hedonic tone along the pleasure on pleasure spectrum. Affect balance is achieved by affect regulation that aims at a positive affect balance. Affect regulation determines attachments, self-esteem and personal development and functioning, but may also change uh, attachment and self-esteem and so on uh, during the lifetime. Attachment, self-esteem and personality guide affect regulation Certain behaviors may both express and or regulate affects. So the infant psychiatry starts here uh, with pregnancy. And affect regulation starts here in utero. Now what, what I would like to emphasize, this is affect regulation. It's not emotional regulation. And I will try to uh, make a distinction that I am talking about affect regulation. Affect and emotions are often used interchangeably, which I think is a mistake. Affect is, affect is a scientifically objectifiable biobehavioral state that we can see from the prenatal through the whole life uh, uh, up, until, up until the end of uh, biological life. So the, from prenatal to the whole postnatal life, affect can be recognized. Emotion, however, is a subjective experience of affect states that results from that level of brain and or mental development when self-object differentiation makes it possible to reflect on one's feelings. This capacity of having emotions develop develops in the postnatal life, but may be lost upon the deterioration of brain functions like in severe brain injury or in Alzheimer's dementia. Affects and affect development uh, has, to be, has to consider that the newborn has no mind, only brain. The brain's developmental potentials depend on individual genetic and epigenetics and on the influences on the caregiving environment. Without adequate and specific stimuli, certain neurological and mental functions, ego functions, may not develop at all. The early infancy, there is no mind, no psychology, but there are affects. Affective and cognitive functions of the mind develop as part of brain development. Effects and cognition are two sides of the same coin. Again, effects are grounded in biology and observable objectively. Effect development can be seen as the effects differentiate from uh, diffuse effect expressions to specific effect forms. Specific affective responses in infancy, like social smile, stranger distress, separation anxiety, 
are the consequences and indicators of brain development and of early stages of mental development. Affect balance is uh, uh, basically a hedonic tone along the uh, pleasure on pleasure spectrum. It's an equilibrium, a homeostasis, which results from the blending of discrete affects. And uh, affect balance may be positive or neutral or negative. And it's achieved by affect regulation. Here you can see the vertical uh, line represents the pleasure on pleasure spectrum. The upper portion is the positive effects, the lower portion is the negative effects. At the newborn period and early infancy, the effects are undifferentiated, like quiet alertness would be a positive state, a diffuse tension, a negative. But as development goes, we can specifically identify pleasure, curiosity, or interest, distress, sadness, and anger. Definitions and functions of uh, and conceptualization of affects have been uh, attempted by many people. Spitz and MD and collaborators considered it a biobehavioral state. Steckler and, and uh, Carpenter said it was a social signal. Freud said it was an interpsychic signal. Spitz said the, it is the trailblazer of development and the language of preverbal infancy. Assessment of the affective and cognitive functioning means the assessment of the developing mind, psyche, namely the assessment of the mental health of infants. So how did I get here? I trained in child psychiatry at the Children's Psychiatric Hospital at the University of Michigan Medical School. Professor Umberto Nahera was the director of CPH, where he established a child analytic study program and the RAIN uh, infant study program. Child psychiatrists learned about early development and about observational skills. Observational skills are extremely important. At the end of my training, I joined the faculty and I joined the infant study program led by Dr. George Friedman, a pediatrician psychoanalyst who gave 10 hours of his time to train child psychiatry fellows in the developmental assessment of infants during the first postnatal year. I was interested in enriching the program's teaching and training functions and wanted to expand it to developmental and clinical research of affective development and later to clinical service as well. With, this, with the support of Professor Nahera, I was able to establish in 1980 the first comprehensive academic infant psychiatric program in the country. The research and clinical service components of the infant psychiatric program required methods by which infants could be systematically assessed, particularly with regard to their affective functioning. The meticulously detailed monitoring of infants' affective functioning and the conceptualization of the data will be summarized in this presentation. This is how locally there was a news about the new infant psychiatry program. So first we established the Michigan Infant Affect Skills, uh, where we could define uh, by behavioral observations, pleasure, interest, or negative effects of distress, sadness, and anger. Of course, some of these can be present concomitantly. We characterize the discrete effects by uh, facial, vocal, verbal, and motor behaviors. Yet, behaviors alone do not define affects. For example, Crying as a behavior could express discrete sadness or distress or anger or a combination of sadness and distress and anger, which can be determined by looking at the facial expression, vocalization, and motor behaviors. The explorative activity as a behavior could express pleasure or interest or 
the combination of pleasure and interest, which can be determined by the facial, vocal, and motor behaviors. Intensity of effects were measured on a five-point scale. We recorded video segments uh, uh, of these uh, uh, sessions. Uh, we'll talk about them later. And uh, broke down the video uh, clip to 10 second intervals. And we, every 10 seconds, we rated these five different effects. And we had specific uh, characterization of what would be, for example, a low level of pleasure, transient, happy facial expression, and et, et cetera. Or what would be a high uh, intensity pressure, broad, sustained, smile, happy, laughing face, etc. The clinical application of the effect scale was simply that once you learn by these very detailed observation uh, the evaluation of these effects, it is like first you learn the letters and then you can uh, learn to read the uh, Ver the, the words, and then finally you can read the sentences. So this is that kind of a skill that you acquire by first meticulously studying the details like the letters, and then you can later um, apply it um, uh, as if you were reading, se reading sentences. So basically the clinical application had to do with that, and of course we proved it by studying that we can come up with the same, same result. Here would be a, an observational vignette, a 15-month-old infant is with her mother in the examination room and slowly moves away from the mother to look at the toys in the room. Only the two of them are there. She manifests a mildly positive affect balance as her interest and pleasure outweigh her distress in the unfamiliar room. When the examiner enters and verbally approaches her and her mother, she shows distress by a surprised and then frightened facial expression by distancing herself from the examiner and finally by sucking her thumb in, while in contact with her mother. She manifests this way a markedly negative affect balance shift as her distress now totally overrides her interest and pleasure. Pleasure is due to the physical contact with her mother and by thumb sucking. In this case, a positive effect is a passive pleasure, not an active interest. Affect regulation. The thesis is that affective functions or affect states are constantly regulated as all organisms aim at maintaining functional equilibrium. The purpose is to achieve a positive affect balance. The mechanism is, by maintaining and re-establishing a positive affect, affect state, or uh, preventing or ameliorating negative affect states. Now the maintenance and prevention may depend on individual capacities or on external factors, persons or objects. The means of effect regulation are somatic, behavioral, and psychological. These are the three domains of the affective system that I conceptualized and will talk a little bit later. Affect regulatory behaviors in infancy was another uh, method that we developed, and uh, we had um, four major behavioral categories, activity, self-related activity, parent-related activity, and examiner-related activity. And uh, these were the four categories of behaviors, and each of these we had ten behaviors uh, listed on a five-point scale. So activity would be uh, these are solitary activities, visual exploration or avoidance or motor activity or posture. Self-related would be thumb sucking, self-feeding, transitional object. Uh, parent-related would be re visual referencing, in other words, glancing at the 
mother, that would be visual referencing, proximity seeking, or contact, asking for help, and examiner related would be the same as parent related. It's important to note that the same behavior may both express and regulate efforts. For example, avoidance or thumb sucking expresses and evaluates distress. Many behaviors, many of these affective behaviors, are precursors of psychological defense mechanisms later. Here is a little greater elaboration of the previous uh, vignette. Here is the 15-month-old infant who is in a um, positive affect state, affect, has a positive affect balance, as her interest in toys outweighs the distress in the unfamiliar <coughs> situation when she is alone with her mother. When the exam examiner enters, she shows a market shift to a negative affect balance as her distress totally overrides her interest and now the goal is to restore a positive affect balance. First, she uses avoidance by turning away and distancing herself from the examiner. Then she seeks proximity to her mother, proceeds making physical contact with her mother and finally also sucks her thumb. She reaches this way a new affect balance that is still negative but much more tolerable. Um, by, by the uh, avoidance and distancing from the examiner, proximity to her mother, the distress lessens, while the contact with the mother and thumb sucking leads to pleasure that counterbalances it. Now, continuing with the situation, since in this situation when now she is in contact with her mother and sucks her thumb and, and uh, feels a little bit better, but not well enough to move on toward her interest, uh, because the strange examiner still causes some distress that prevents her from returning to the exploration of the toys. So additional affect regulation is needed to restore a positive affect balance. The empathic mother recognizes that the infant is unable to reduce her distress any longer, anymore. So she, as an auxiliary ego, verbalizes interest in and moves closer to and picks up toys, it's called modeling, thereby also demonstrates to her infant that the examiner represents no danger. The infant accepts help from her mother, who is an external affect regulator, to rekindle the positive affect of interest by visual and manipulative exploration of the toys. These regulatory behaviors intensify her interest and lessens, lessen her distress, thereby lead to a positive affect balance. There is a blending of the positive and negative affects but the interest outweighs the distress at this time. Now here comes the effective system that I conceptualized um, uh, in the sense that it integrates all those capacities and functions, perceptual, cognitive, language, neuromuscular, that may play a role in affect expression, affect regulation, and affective ties, object relations. Uh, attachment. The affective system in my conceptualis conceptualization has three domains. The somatic, the neurochemical, neurophysiologic, neuroendocrine processes. The behavioral, which I'm focusing in under these circumstances with the infants. Solitary behaviors and social interactions. And psychological, cognitive and language functions. The newborn has only the somatic and behavioral domains, but by six months, the traces of the psychological domain may appear, indicating the beginnings of self-object differentiation with the traces of self-awareness 
and of affective styles of object relations of attachment. Affects are observable from, so, so considering the affective system, sorry, in the context of the psychoanalytic theory, I would say that affects are observable from the pre-representational, pre-psychological stages of brain development, when only the somatic domain, the ego apparatus, and the behavioral domain, ego functions, of the affective system exist. If drives were to be considered, were to thought of strictly as psychological forces, as Charles Blenner suggested, not as somatic needs, there would be no drives to be considered before the psychological domain the ego functions of the, of the affective system become evident. Once positive affective ties to the mental representations of persons, self or others develop, those may become sources of wishes, libidinal drive derivatives, while negative affective experiences cause aversion, aggressive drive derivatives. So now, to examine the infant, uh, I developed a protocol which is um, like the medical physical examination. That, that's what I had in mind. Namely, to try to go through the infant's functioning and checking uh, the infant in different situations and different ways from different angles. So this infant clinical assessment procedure, or ICAP, is a clinical and research tool for the systematic longitudinal assessment of affective, cognitive, and motor development and functioning of the three to thirty six month old children. Structured assessment, like the medical physical examination, if performed repeatedly, it provides comparable data on affective and cognitive functioning for developmental, clinical, or research purposes. This ICAP focuses on the infant's affect expressions and affect regulation. The infant is evaluated in the context of his or her relationship with the caregiver, the parent, since the infant's affect state may depend on it. The eight episodes of the ICAP represent a variety of affective and cognitive and social stimuli. The infant is in the crib before the age of independent walking, but on the carpeted floor was able to walk independently. In both situations there are toys available to the infant. The parent sits along the wall directly visible to the infant. The examiner, when not directly interacting with the infant, also sits along the wall. The eight um, episodes are free play, reaction to the examiner, parent-infant interaction, examiner-infant interaction in the context of developmental testing, free play again, with the difference between the first period and the fifth one is that in the fifth episode the examiner is in, in the room. Then comes the separation from the parent, when the parent is asked to, to leave for, for uh, three minutes, and then reunion with the parents, and finally physical uh, contact with the examiner when the infant is weighed and we do some minor motor uh, testing on the infant. These episodes are not constrained by timing them with a stopwatch, but still have distinct uh, periods. After the whole thing, the examiner briefly summarizes the finding and answers questions. So the whole examination lasts about 70, 80 minutes. So here are the episodes in some detail. I'm not going to uh, read all, all of them. Just the fact that these 
uh, episode represents different questions. For example, the first episode um, inquires into the exploration and play activity, spontaneous activity of the of the infant, and also some impression about the infant parent relationship. The reaction to the examiner is studying uh, or evaluating the stranger anxiety. The parent-infant interaction is a task that they have to perform together and uh, here again the infant-parent relationship is the question. Development of the testing and interaction with the examiner. Here the examiner takes the place of the parent who was doing something in the previous episode with the infant and goes through uh, the Bailey scales of infant development, at least certain portion of it that would be applicable to this particular age. And in this, this episode, the question is about the cognitive and fine motor abilities and uh, affective and social responsiveness to the examiner. So here is when, uh, when an infant is at a, a table and, and uh, works on some tests provided for him or her. So here uh, is an description of, a, of an episode of a developmental testing where the infant is uh, lower than this table uh, sit across the examiner and uh, the examiner presents certain items that the infant would then work on. And uh, so this is this 15 month old infant facing the examiner over the table to work with the test items. For affect regulation she holds a security blanket uh, for sufficient pleasure to counterbalance her distress about the unfamiliar, unfamiliar challenges while distanced from the mother, because the mother is sitting uh, a little bit far away at the, at the wall. So, so she uses the uh, security blanket and she also uses referencing, namely glancing at the mother for affect regulation. This way she has a mildly positive affect balance so as to be able to take the test. While working with the pegs and pad board, these are with the pad board and the pegs have to be put in those holes, uh, the mastery of the task increases her interest and uh, so much so that she lets the security blanket uh, go. So she has the security blanket, starts to work on the flags and she gets so interested in it that it just drops. She doesn't even look after it, just drops. She doesn't need the security blanket anymore for pleasure, neither does she need the referencing to regulate distress. By her own mastery activity, she is able to achieve a high positive effect balance, which she would like to maintain by continuing the mastery activity. However, upon finishing this test, the examiner removes the pegs and the pegboard, and the infant immediately reacts with whiny protestation, expressing anger and distress, because she has lost the affect regulatory behavior that maintained the positive affect balance. So, she again is in a negative affect balance, so she picks up the security blanket and strokes her face with it, uh, which generates enough pleasure to re-establish a mildly positive affect balance by her own affect regulatory activity that enables her to look at what the examiner will bring to the table next time. The visual exploration at, uh, at the new item that is coming generates interest and upon receiving the next item, a baby doll, she grabs it with both hands and experiences so much pleasure and interest that she lets the security blanket drop again to the floor. By her visual and manipulative explorative activity and play uh, with the baby doll, she generates such robust positive affect balance on her own that she does not need the security blanket for affect regulation. So this is what happened. The examiner comes in, the affect balance goes down, then some regulatory activity comes in, the effect, a new effect balance is established. 
then as she, uh, let's say, plays with the, uh, the test items and gets interested uh, and adds, add, and, uh, adds uh, to her armamentarium uh, uh, an effect regulator, being those toys in the master activity, and her effect balance goes up. Then it is taken away from her, the peg and pegboard, again the effect balance drops, and some uh, new uh, regulatory activity uh, would have to come in to bring it back to uh, other positive effect balance. So here we are now after development of testing of the free play. Again, uh, the same uh, questions in uh, episode one. Separation from the parent is a separation anxiety. Reunion with the parent the effective uh, reaction to the return of the parent and in the eighth episode gross motor abilities and responsiveness to the examiner. So this is how it could look numerically for example just simply looking at pleasure and distress. Let's say in the 12 month period the free pay was uh, 3.1 uh, pleasure level when the mother uh, leaves the room it drops down to 1.9 when one mother comes back, it starts to increase again. The biggest uh, change in, his, uh, in this particular case was at the 18-month uh, period when the separation uh, created the deepest uh, drop in pleasure and the highest increase in distress. So the ratio uh, uh, is the lowest, 0 0.3. But this is just to il illustrate that, uh, that one can play with these things uh, using numbers, uh, and these are fairly uh, reliable numbers uh, that we can come up with. So the clinical uh, use of the ICAP is to assess the infant's affective, cognitive and motor functioning, ego development, assessing the infant's attachment to the caregiver, of object relations, as well as the individual sense of self, self-object differentiation. Assessment of the parental attitude toward the infant is uh, in the parent-infant task episode where you can uh, apply the parent task facilitation scale that we also uh, developed, uh, which rates the parent's behavior uh, in five categories. Modeling, cooperation, interference, controlling, or non-involvement. And, and this is the parental functions that we can uh, characterize. Um, then, of course, the ICAP is useful to interpret for the parent the relevant observations and conclusions about the infant's behaviors. Uh, in other words, uh, explain to the parents what these different behaviors mean, how to interpret and understand the expression and regulation of effects, as well as the ways the parents might have those if necessary. When, it, when I say under three years means not necessarily chronological age but developmental age. In other words, it would apply to any child that functions below the three year level and I was showed in the case of an autistic child a little bit later. Then I came up with this effect balance principle on the basis of these uh, observations and, and, uh, and uh, findings that um, showed that uh, effect regulation was very, very important for the achievement and maintenance of a positive effect balance. Not pleasure, just a positive effect balance. We'll come up later if somebody would use the term emotional comfort. Um, so that would be a positive effect balance. And that led me to the postulation of the effect balance principle that corresponds to brain development, ego apparatus, and to the development of affect regulation, a fundamental ego function, from the time that the fetus becomes sentient. You know, from the time that the fetus perceives pain pain or stress. 
from that point on, the effect that its principle applies. Uh, the effect that its principle points to the basic need of controlling affect states. In, in, in other words, the importance of affective homostasis. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the affect regulation starts in utero and the affect balance principle starts there too. And this is not emotional regulation. The affect balance principle postulates <coughs> it governs the behaviors of infants via affect regulatory behaviors of the caregiver and of the infant. Determines the development of affect linked memory traces and then the mental representations of self, other persons, inanimate objects, own body parts, activities based on their in affect regulatory functions. The affect balance principle offers a testable explanation of attachments, including the type, quality, changes and disorders of attachment and for the treatment of the attachment disorders. It has diagnostic and therapeutic benefit by considering that, it, uh, that an anxious and or depressive uh, emotional state of a patient may be the consequence of the loss of an important affect regulator on functional capacity, for example, somebody loses a leg or get blind or whatever, um, or loses another person or job or an object or activity. So these, these could be all triggering uh, depression and anxiety uh, on the counts of a, a positive effect regulation has been, has been lost. So my theory of attachment is based on the effect balance principle and it's underlying, uh, as it's underlying an exploratory mechanism definition, the infant's experience with the affect regulation determines the development of an attachment to mental representations of past persons, part of persons, self, own body parts, activities, inanimate object, not just to the mental representation of the mother. Looking at other attachment theories, the classical theory of Bowlby postulates that the infant's innate biological tendency is to seek safety, security, and protection. This is a vague and not measurable, but particularly in the early postnatal periods, where the infant cannot show any kind of uh, seeking uh, closeness with the parent and so on. My theory states that the infants, even the fetuses, innate biological need is to seek positive effect balance. What we said, the infant as a social creature initiates relationship with the caregiver. I say the infant does not initiate relationship but expresses her affect state. Develops relationship with the caregiver only if the caregiver proves to be an effective and reliable affect regulator. The infant's experience is the important uh, After Bowlby, uh, Mary Ainsworth and her group uh, uh, worked further on attachment theories and uh, they conceptualized a secure base by which the mother uh, by which the mother provides the needed safety, security, and protection that Paul was talking about. The strange situation paradigm involves uh, infants of about one year of age and characterizes the different types of attachments. My, my episode of uh, separation, reunion, and so on, basically uh, was taken from this uh, um, strange situation paradigm of arrangement. Material attunement response determines the quality of the secure base. 
In other words, they postulate that there is a secure base um, for the safety and security and protection, and the secure base depends on the mother's attunement in response to the infant. It determines the type of attachment to the mother, whether it's secure or insecure, and the insecure could be avoidant, ambivalent, or disorganized. My theory states that the secure base is where the infant reliably experiences a positive affect balance. The quality and effectiveness of the maternal attunement in providing a secure base depends on the infant's subjective experience. And I will talk about it a little bit later, so it's not so much what the mother does, what's important to what the infant experiences. So a generic ob observation would be that a few months old infant repeatedly experiences over a period of time that when she's in a negative affect state, it is her mother who consistently and effectively relieves her from the distress and pain, etc. The process of a secure attachment is on the way. The infant starts to look for the mother to provide such relief when it is needed. A little bit later, a two or three year old infant or toddler is, uh, let's imagine, is in a company of some other toddlers and they are uh, having some cooperative or parallel play with peers while the adults, rel other relatives and friends, socialize at some distance. But suddenly the infants get upset, frightened or angry about something and cries in distress and in anger. She looks for and runs to the person among the adults who would most likely and effectively relieve the negative ex affective experience, who has been experienced so far in her life to be the best affect regulator among those present, toward whom the securest, strongest attachment has developed. A concrete case is uh, Katie, a four-month-old infant, who progressed well in her only development. Her mother was very pleased by her calm nature, but was concerned about her four-year-old brother's aggressive behaviors toward Katie. When mother stepped out of the room, the brother often hit Katie right in the head, threw toys at her, or tried crash into her with his four-wheeler. In her fright, Katie cried intensely, which made mother rush in and pick her up to console her. When we see her at four months of age, she was calm, alert, and curious in her mother's arms. However, Soon after she was placed in the crib and looked at the items that the examiner uh, presented to her. She is laying down and the examiner uh, shows some items or, or offers items to grab it and so on. As soon as that process started, uh, she became distressed and cried. So the mother had to console her, picking her up. And, uh, and this repeated again and again um, during the testing. In this sequence of repeated intense distress responses, only the mother's holding helped. It stopped the crying instantaneously. Once, the mother, once in the mother's arms, and once she could see her face, she was able to look around and even smile at the examiner. So we realized that when the test items were presented to her in the crib, she was not distressed by what she saw, but what she did not see, and what she lost, lost contact with, namely her mother. Because when she was focusing on those items, the mother out of her mind and then she got distressed. 
Katie's distress was precocious stranger anxiety, the so-called eight-month anxiety by Spitz. A measure of brain development evident in cognitive and affective functions and a measure of developing attachment to the mother. The early repeated traumatic experiences in the absence of mother accelerated ego development, including the self-object differentiation. As her reliance on mother for affect regulation increased, so did the intensity of her attachment. Affect regulation and attachment went hand in hand. Katie's stranger distress remained intense to 10 months of age. <coughs> Being held by her mother was necessary to re-establish a positive affect balance. But by 12 months, as she <coughs> sat at the table during the testing, she held her security blanket, and when her distress increased, she also sucked her tongue and looked at her mother but she didn't need physical contact anymore. Her anxious, insecure attachment would have, uh, would have bearing on her sense of self, too. Yet future experiences with affect regulation may change the quality of her attachment, as well as her self-esteem later in her childhood or adulthood. A caregiver's affect regulator, um, caregiver as affect regulator may determine the quality of attachment, and of course this is what, what Innsbruck was emphasizing, that it depended on the mother. The caregiver uh, may promote affect regulation, may fail to promote affect regulation, or may interfere with affect regulation. So if the caregiver promotes affect regulation, that would result in a secure attachment. If the uh, caregiver fails to promote affect regulation, it will result in an ambivalent anxious attachment. If the caregiver interferes with the affect regulation, then it would be an avoidant disorganized attachment. The two uh, Latter examples uh, show empathic failure on the mother's side, or may show empathic failure, while the first one is um, shows empathic um, empathic reciprocity. And coming back to the infant's experience with affect regulation determines the, uh, the attachment to the caregiver. The quality of attachment statistically uh, seems to be that um, most infants, 65%, have secure attachment and 35% insecure. The insecure attachment may be ambivalent anxious, where the infant experiences the caregiver as inconsistently reliable, avoidant or anxious, when the infant experiences the caregiver as rejecting, not an effect regulator, disorganized attachment, uh, experience uh, when the infant experiences a caregiver as confusing and or abusive. At times there may be an aversion instead of attachment. Once secure attachment has developed to somebody or something, it will be preferentially used for affect regulation. The caregiver, the thumb sucking, the inanimate object. The attachment behaviors, the proximity, uh, contact seeking, communication, are affect regulatory behaviors. So, so Ainsworth and, and her um, successors in, in the scientific field would talk about attachment behaviors. I would talk about affect regulatory behaviors. The atypical infant has a typical experience is with affect regulation and has atypical attachments. The key to this definition of attachment is the infant's experience. The infant's subjective experience, uh, if the infant 
was not able to experience somebody or something as an affect regulator, no attachment would develop. If the infant experienced the affect regulator in a distorted way, the attachment would be distorted or insecure. The infant may develop attachment to others than the caregiver if she experiences other means of affect regulation reliable and effective. It could be siblings or relatives or activities or self-related activities. If these happen to give the infants the experience that these are more reliable than the caregiver, then the attachment would be stronger to these things than to the caregiver. The infant may have limited or compromised effect experience with some external effect, effect stimuli because of anatomical anomalies, damages, or neurochemical or neurophysiologic dysfunction or chronic pain. In these situations, the, the infant has compromised experience with effect regulation that somebody else might provide to her. Since an atypical infant also has the need to experience a positive affect balance, his or her affect regulation and attachment will be atypical too. Such are the infants suffering from autistic spectrum disorders or traumatized by repeated painful experiences due to corrective medical interventions, etc. Such limiting conditions interfere with the caregiver being experienced as affect regulator, i.e. interfere with the development of a secure or even insecure attachment to the caregiver, even though it's not the caregiver's fault, so to speak. So in some such situations, the attachment disorders may look as if it, if, as if it was caused by the caregiver, but it was not the caregiver, it was the infant who couldn't, couldn't experience because of those other uh, interfering factors, uh, experience the caregiver uh, as a reliable and effective affect regulator. So here is the a, a autistic child. David was referred for psychiatric evaluation for the management of his behaviors. He had no words or any other means of, to communicate with anybody. He seemed to live in his own world. His stereotypic activities seemed aimless and were incomprehensible even to his parents. They often isolated him in a cage as if he was an animal. I examined him during the, uh, using the ICAP by assessment um, protocol, it was immediately evident that he had no attachment to his mother. He completely ignored her without evidence of avoidance and didn't even notice when she left the room. He showed interest only in the inanimate objects in my office. I noticed, however, that he carried a tennis shoe in his hand, an additional shoe to the ones he had on his feet. For brief periods, while he handled a new, a new object with both hands, he relinquished the special shoe. It very much looked like uh, that 15 months old baby that, uh, that I talked about with the peg and pegboard uh, who was dropping her security blanket while performing something that interested her and uh, that served as an effect regulator and, and she didn't need the, didn't need the security blanket. The, this autistic child was able to drop sometimes this special shoe while he got interested in something other. So in a given moment, when he put down that shoe, to attend to and explore other objects, I picked it up and hid it behind my back. When he reached for it and couldn't find it, he exploded 
into panic-like intense agitation. He seemed desperate in his search for it. He soon figured it out that I had made his shoe disappear and kept it behind my back. So he got into a purposefully personal and aggressive physical fight with me. He hit me and tried to overpower me just to get his shoe back. There was no letdown in his determination. He seemed totally committed to the shoe as if he couldn't live without it. He continued to ignore and didn't turn to his mother even in his distress. When finally I gave the shoe back to him, he immediately relaxed. I was of no further interest to him. He didn't show any animosity toward me, continued his activities and didn't want to leave the room. My interpretation of this was that autistic children do have affectivity and need affect regulation and have a need for affect regulation. And thus the affect balance principle applies to their behaviors as well. Autistic children develop attachments too if they experience something as a reliable affect regulator, as David showed strong attachment to his tennis shoe. They experience, they experience inanimate objects and simple activities as affect regulators because they, can, because they can control those for their own affective benefits. Their brain pathology prevents them from experiencing human interactions as affect regulators, probably because those are distressingly complex stimuli. Parent and parents and therapists may be able to help them in reaching and maintaining positive affect balance by understanding and guiding the autistic child's affect regulatory activities and thereby foster a slowly developing attachment. But when those are blocked, these affect regulatory activities are blocked or interfered with, the affect balance turns negative and thereby foster aversion instead of attachment. So the conclusion is that affect balance is a basic need achieved by affect regulation. Affect regulation leads to attachments and uh, affect self-esteem. Affect regulation also has a role in personality development. The affect balance principle, govern, principle governs the early development of and later changes in attachment and self-esteem, which are important building blocks of individuals' personal development, relationships, self-regulation, coping. The clinical application of the affect balance principle means to look at behaviors in order to understand the affective dynamics look at behaviors for the affect they express and or regulate. Not look at behaviors for as clinical problems uh, they, they represent and not as problem behaviors that are to be corrected, but for affects that they express or regulate. So, in the next lecture, I will continue with the clinical application of the affect balance principle, and I thank you very much for your attention.